From the center of the universe, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, this is the SDM Show with your host, Rob Cairns. The SDM Show focuses on business, life, productivity, digital marketing, WordPress, and more. Sit back, relax, grab your favorite drink, and enjoy the show. Here is Rob. Hey, everybody. Rob Cairns here. In today's podcast, I'm here with my good friend, Warren Lane Nada, and we're going to talk about his book, Digital Thinking Version 2.0. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation that Warren and I had. This episode of the STM Show is sponsored by Stunning Digital Marketing, the agency to handle all your WordPress website security needs. Go on over to stunningdigitalmarketing.com and find out how we can help you secure your website so you no longer have an issue with backups, being hacked, or your website being compromised. That's stunningdigitalmarketing.com. Hey, everybody. Rob Cairns here. Today, I'm here with my good friend, Warren Lane Nada, and we're going to talk his book about his book, Digital Thinking Version 2.0. How are you today, Warren? Hello, Rob. How are you? Uh, doing well in Toronto. It's a little overcast mm-hmm. at the time of this record, and we're into rainy season. And how is oh. life in Europe? Um, well, it's another beautiful, sunny, um, early evening. Um, we haven't had rain here, I think, in about six weeks, and there's none on the horizon. Yeah. So you've been on with me a couple of times. We've talked with you and Bridget together, Williard. We've talked mm-hmm. about version one of this book. And I thought we'd go and visit version two. Uh, when we talked last week, I hadn't finished the book. I've now finished mm-hmm. it. Um, congratulations on doing such a great job on the book, by the way. Thank you very much. That's nice to hear. Very kind. It was a, it was a good read. And uh, the problem is my highlighter has found lots of spots in the book. So that's a good thing, even for – Somebody has been doing it a while. Mm-hmm. I always learn something. So thanks again. Much appreciated. Great. Good to hear. So let's jump into um, a couple topics in the book. The first mm-hmm. one is e-commerce. And you spend mm-hmm. a lot of time in this book talking about e-commerce, um, a chapter. And mm-hmm. the world has kind of changed in the last two years with the pandemic. And I personally think the e-commerce onslaught was coming anyway. The pandemic just made it happen faster. Your thoughts? Mm. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I I think so. I think that, um, you know, a a lot of the things that we're we're doing now, you know, are eventually going to come. And as you say, you know, um, whenever there's a crisis, this – this speeds up change. Um, usually we see this in war, you know, um, we wouldn't have computers or we might not have computers as fast if we didn't have world war II. Um, and, you know, there's lots of this sort of technology that comes out of necessity. Um, so certainly um, e- e-commerce um, through the pandemic, um, you know, was for us at that time, very, very important. And, um, interesting that you raised that question because um, I saw numbers about um, German e-commerce sales and uh, deliveries, and they've actually gone down about 20% in the last couple of months. Mm-hmm. And um, this is being attributed to the fact that, well, the stores are now open and most of the rules and regulations, at least here in Germany, have been relaxed um, so, uh, yeah, I think on, on one hand it's, it's, you know, it was good. It is good that we can order things, um, at home. Um, but I'm, um, I'm wondering if there's going to be a, a little bit of, if not backlash, people will, um, look fondly on the days of going into a store. Um, and if this is going to turn around perhaps a little bit, um, but I think as, as you say, this is, uh, you know, e-commerce um, is, is here to stay. And th- there are so many benefits that, yes, 
I think you're right. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was looking back at my Amazon Prime account last night because mm -hmm. I've been an Amazon Prime user since the day it came into Canada. And mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. even before the pandemic, I had actually, as a consumer, not as a web guy, yeah. I had increased the amount I was buying online. And part of it is mm -hmm. choice. Part yes. of it is price. Mm -hmm. And part of it is time. So yes. I ordered, yesterday morning, I ordered a Mother's Day gift for my mother. Shh. I, you know, and this won't come out till after Mother's Day. So I can say I won't this. say anything. No, me neither. And uh, I ordered it on Amazon and I had it in five hours. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. that is not worth running around for at the price of time and gas. And we all yeah. know with the mess in the Ukraine, gas prices have gone through the roof. Well, so, here as well. They're 30% uh, higher than they were perhaps a month ago. Yep. So that's a factor. Yeah. And I think I've done my Christmas shopping for about the last eight or nine years pretty well on Amazon. So yes. that's a factor. Yes, me too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just mm -hmm. kind of keeps on going. And that's where I kind of stand. So yeah. I'm okay with that. Now, as a... Oh, I just want to, can I jump back? <laughs> sure, of course you can. <laughs> because what you said, um, I, I, you know, I think that's an important aspect. And I mean... There is a chapter in the book that is called e-commerce is not an online shop. Of course. And I, I think it's it's very important what you said that, um, you, you know, we use e-commerce for all of the reasons and because we're shopping. And like you say, it's convenience. It's the time. You know, it's the choice. It's it's everything that um, that revolves around the shopping except and um uh the, the the subtitle of the book is um uh you know digital thinking um and um i can never pronounce this because it's french and and i'm english <laughs> um websites online marketing and our digital flannery um, and I think this is an important distinction in um, online shopping and offline shopping. Yes. Um, because when we shop in real time on the streets, in the high street, wherever it is, we're shopping, but we're really not. We're strolling. We're looking. It's a social event. We're getting some exercise. Um, so it's really, you know, we're browsing as, um, as, as, as an activity that we can do online, but offline, you know, there's something about that's very different. And it would be a shame and interesting to see what um, replaces that once um, there are fewer and fewer stores which we already see here. There's so many stores that are now closed um, because of the last two years. And if that comes back, um, because people like browsing, they like going to the mall and looking at things without actually buying anything. Um, I wanted to throw that in there. I'm sorry. Just Oh, not, not to worry. And, and while we're talking about e-commerce, we always think about tangible shopping. I bought a mm -hmm. shirt. I bought a computer part. Mm -hmm. And I want to throw this out there. We've been doing e-commerce with restaurants in the pandemic mm -hmm. a lot. Skip mm -hmm. the dishes, Uber Eats. And I would say those have greatly declined um, in all of this because mm -hmm. people want to get out and socialize with the restrictions mm -hmm. coming down. So I would say Very much so. You know, people aren't doing as much online uh, delivery for food. And that is really a form of e-commerce and people don't think of that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's very, very true. That's very true. I, so I think I when it comes to, to food and shopping, it's so much of a social aspect, you know, um, you know, we, we, we meet someone for coffee, but we're probably not drinking coffee. You know, it's just this euphemism, uh, whether it be shopping or eating or whatever it is, for social contact. And yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to jump into another chapter in the book. And depending on the listener, this might go over well. It might not go over well. Oh, I think I know what you're going to talk about. <laughs> I'm looking at a chapter called Virtual Relationship. <laughs> 
sex ah, and, mm-hmm. and health. Yes. And, and I want to go to health is a different ball game because that's not just the relationship part and we can go there. But mm-hmm. we all know that about six months ago, there was a website called OnlyFans. And they went yes. through a spiel where the payment processors basically leveraged on them and said, we're not going to accept any more payments for buying pictures were, that were risque. We'll, we'll mm. leave it at that. Mm. And mm. it was kind of funny because they made all their money off risque pictures at the time. Yes. And I think what was happening was they had a large number of chargebacks from angry wives calling the credit card company and saying, I didn't buy this. <laughs> <laughs> or angry husbands. <laughs> Who were in trouble with their wives saying, I didn't buy this. But that all said, the virtual world does give some people some anonymity. And they don't have to worry about what people think. And you kind of talk about that in the book a little bit. Do you yeah. have any thoughts on that you want to share? <laughs> um, oh, I could go on for quite a while about that. I, I think, you know, you, you touch on on, on pornography um, or yeah. erotica um, or whatever else um, consenting, hopefully consenting adults are getting up to online. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, the, the most obvious or tangible aspect, um, of, um, you know, the, the dark side of, of our digital culture. Um, but probably only because it is relatable to still real time, you know, um, and uh, but it's it really is only one aspect of um, the fact that we spend so much time alone online. You know, mm-hmm. we're we're so connected, but at the same time, so alone. Yeah. Um, there's much we get up to, um, whether. Um, in an anonymous um, uh, capacity or uh, with our actual um, name and, um, and profile. Yep. Um, you know, I think that um, anytime we want to do mischief, we will, regardless of, um, you know, if it's online, offline, or how many locks are on the door. I agree. Um, and, and I don't think that's, that's, ever, cha- that's ever been any different. Yep. Um, but I, I think, you know, there's definitely, a, you know, a, a positive side because at the same time that, um, that technology gives us the ability to perhaps, you know, instead of being the, the burly truck driver, um, to be the effeminate, um, waitress, uh, on, online, um, it does give, marginalized people an opportunity to participate in a way that they cannot do or might be unwilling to do offline. Yes. Um, and I, you know, I think that's, that's probably important if it's, if it's done sensibly and that's always the question, well, who's, you know, how, how is it done sensibly? But um, you have to give adults credit for making decisions for themselves um, and, and, and technology, whether it be a website or, um, a sexual aid or the ability to be in contact with someone and to live out a consenting fantasy, um, mm-hmm. that, that has got to be in some way healthier, um, than, than denying it and then possibly hurting yourself or others by playing this out um uh real time yeah of um, course. i'm sure i'll be crucified from one side or the other but um uh 
our 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 desires have have always been there, and we will find some way to um, to express those desires in one way or another. Yep. Um, and I would, possibly I would, online is a safer place. Yep. I would I would agree with that. And one of the parts you say in that chapter is health, and mm. I want to kind of take the health discussion in a different way. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people have been able to contact with therapists online right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've done Mm -hmm. some of that. A lot of people have been able to have virtual doctor's appointments. We've rethought Mm -hmm. how we do things. Um, I had a good friend who had knee replacement surgery and did group physio online on a Zoom call every twice a week for Mm -hmm. 10 weeks. So there are. And, you know, that was a benefit because she didn't worry about getting to the hospital because she wasn't driving at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's all kinds of benefits, like health-wise, to doing stuff online in the digital world. Yeah. And I think that's really important. It goes Um, back to the – oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) It's okay. Go ahead. I was going to say there's – you know, there is that saying – it's it's it goes something like um you know for effective effective medicine um requires a village something like this medical care requires a village um you know you can't do it by yourself and that's that's definitely an advantage to um to our online um connectivity because um if we are not actually living in a village um we are connected to the whole world so we do have that um capacity and capability um you know if i think about you know perhaps doctors or patients who are um uh disconnected physically in some out of the way place um or you know you do not have access to information or or a therapist um online certainly offers these um in a way that that our real physical world um is struggling to yeah. yeah, and we talk. The other thing I wanted to jump on to is um, mm-hmm. you have a chapter and a comment in the book about using your devices. Mm-hmm. And so when we think devices, most people think about the computer, the laptop, the iPad, the Android mm-hmm. tablet, and the phone. Mm-hmm. And I would argue there's so much more than that. What about mm-hmm. that? A-L-E-X-A device sitting behind on your desk. What mm-hmm, about the mm-hmm. G device sitting on your desk? And I'm not mm-hmm. going to say the names because I'll set them off for everybody. Yes, exactly. What, a, what <laughs> about that doorbell sitting on your front door that shows you who's coming up to your door? Yes. Those are all digital devices that we need to think about and nobody does. Yes, Oh, I, I agree. Um, I mean, the phone is something we always have in our hand, um, but you know, we have our digital assistants, which we yeah. are not all using as well as we as we could, or we probably will. Probably in the same way as you know, we we went through this this process of understanding and and perhaps learning our our mobile devices. Um, but there's our di- our, um, our our digital assistants that we could use better. Um, there are all the smart home um, uh, things. We have, you know, we have a washing machine that is connected, that is connected, you know, to the internet, and you know, so it can we can download cycles. It can communicate with me if it's got a problem or if it's finished. Um, you know, there are all of the smart watch. Um, uh, things that we can do. We can track our sleep and our health. And um, the list is really endless. Coffee machines, you know, refrigerators, dishwashers. Um, so if you've got the desire and you have the, the resources, so space, connectivity, money, um, you know, you can really have these devices um, uh, connected across uh, across every need and desire. Um, mm-hmm. But not everyone can do that, um, which is probably a more interesting question than what can we do with these is, ra- is rather um, what can those who do not have these not be able to do? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and unfortunately, having all these devices – 
brings in the whole privacy discussion too. Like, is the mm-hmm. doorbell, a video doorbell, private? Is your mm-hmm. digital assistant listening to you what you're doing? Mm-hmm. Um, and where that stands with privacy and the privacy advocates. I'm probably um, either too new school or too old school. Um, but, <laughs> you know, we all, I always have this module in my class. We will always talk about um, online regulations and privacy. I mean, the things that we have to have. But, you know, I always raise an eyebrow when someone says, they're very concerned about this, but at the same time have no qualm in using um, this. They sort of expect that I get to use it, but I'm completely protected. And we don't have, we've never, we've never had privacy um, in our offline, in our pre-digital world. Um, If people wanted to find information about you, they would. Um, yep. and, um, I don't think that's changed anymore. And if you're using a device or if you're online, um, or if you put something online or if you search for something, I think you need to accept and understand that this is information that's open to anyone. And if you're concerned, then half of me wonders why you're concerned and the other half of me wonders, well, then you have a responsibility to protect your privacy in some way. I mean, if you're concerned with your children's privacy, then I would wonder why your Facebook is full of pictures of your children. You can't have it both ways. Yep. Um, I think it's one of those things we pay for because people, we expect for some reason, we expect that and we get so much from every provider and every device um, that these things are free. You know, I've got a smartwatch that does so much for me. It costs $20. Um, mm-hmm. Google provides 99% of its services for free. Well, they have to get something from this, and that is information about us. And if if you're not willing to sort of get, you know, this give and take, then I think you're being, uh, people are being very naive. Um, I'm probably the guy... On, at the park with the little desk that says, you know, um, convince me that information about you is so important that that you need to be worried about being, you know, logged on incognito. You nice. know, I, I, I think we have an overinflated idea about the value of our privacy because I don't think we've ever had privacy. Um, not no, at all. I, if we have a credit card, we don't have privacy. You know, if I mean, you so use things, loyal, yeah. if yeah. you use a loyalty card in the store, mm-hmm. you don't have privacy. The reason mm-hmm. they give you stuff nope. is in exchange for your data. There's I always mean, been that, yes. And if you walk into a store, you don't have privacy either because you're no. on video camera. <laughs> I of mean, it, the course. only way you're going to get true privacy is to go live in the, on the moon in a bubble and cut yourself off from the world. I mean, exactly. Yeah, I believe that. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. (laughs) I'm in that camp. Um, Let's jump on to your chapter about page builders. And one of the things that I really liked was you talked about Gutenberg as a page builder. Now, for those who listen to this podcast, they know I've been in the Gutenberg camp for almost a year now. I'm heavily Uh invested in Gutenberg. Mm -hmm. And then you go on to say, use a lightweight theme. So Mm -hmm. I do. um, I have Mm -hmm. gone with cadence theme and cadence box, which are pretty lightweight. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you talk about the other page builders. We Mm -hmm. are certainly getting into a no code environment, whether we want to admit it or not. Mm -hmm. What do you feel about page builders? Um. Well, um, I've done over 300 websites for countless clients, and one of those websites uses a page builder, and that's Elementor. No other website from no other client has used anything 
close to Elementor, <laughs> <laughs> which tells me that, you know, if you've got 300 websites running and one, you know, then obviously you don't really need them. Yep. Um, I think, I mean, th they are tools, they are means to an end. And um, what I love about um, CMS, and I guess specifically WordPress, is that it enables people to build websites who otherwise might not be able to or might not want to. Um, so if, if it means that they are going to be excited about using their website and updating it and, and seeing what they can do, and if that means Elementor or a Bakery Builder or a Divi or God knows what else, then use it and I applaud you and I will help you where I can. Um, I don't think that these things are necessary, but okay. I mean, I can build websites. I could like code a website. And um, I I only use a tool when it's necessary. You know, I, I'm not a power tool guy. You know, I, I <laughs> we have a hedge here that goes around the house that is that is a monster. And we've been here six years. And I fought this hedge tooth and nail with a hand clippers until this year. And I finally bought then an electric hedge trimmer. Now I still have a manual um, lawnmower, which I push back and forth. So that's me in a nutshell. Yeah. I will do what I can with basic tools until I've reached that edge where I can't, I need something more. And I'm the same way with websites. Um, I was a long term, uh, uh, a long time Drupal user builder, um, built all the websites of Drupal, um, Joomla. Um, and I only got into WordPress in 2013 because they were the CMS that had a mobile friendly theme. All right, so that saved me time. Um, but I tell you, when they came out, when, when WordPress switched to the Gutenberg blocks, I had serious emotional trauma. <laughs> you and half the community. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I downloaded and started using classic press. You know, I wrote letters to my senator. I fasted. Um, but I've come to like them. And, you know, if I had to choose, um, then again, I use Gutenberg blocks or I am using B Gutenberg blocks until I hit a wall that says I can't do what I want to do with Gutenberg blocks. Then I will look for options. And until now, I, I haven't got to that point, which doesn't mean I won't come to that point, but I just haven't got there yet. So for me, if you've got a page builder, I'm wondering what it is that you need to build. And is it a default? It's almost like a knee jerk reaction now. It's like, okay, yes. I'm going to include this theme and I'm going to download Elementor and I'm going to, you know, buy myself a pizza. It's like, well, have you thought this out? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's a case of old habits are hard to break, right? It's people get into the habit of doing things one way and they don't see that maybe there's a better way sometimes. Well, it's interesting as well because, you know, I'm, I'm an old, I'm an old white guy just like you. There's a few of us out there. Um, and we can't change. We're old, we're white, we're guys. So there you go. Um, and, you know, we and people much older than us built the internet. I mean, building websites and an agency in 1998. So, you know, we've sort of helped build and put together this online world. And, you know, I, I spend a I don't spend a lot of time, but I spend some time um, in discussions with people um, much, much younger than myself who will tr explain to me then why I don't understand what's going on. Otherwise, I would use a page builder. And I think, I don't know, you know, like you weren't born when we were building websites. There wasn't even Dreamweaver then. So... I don't know. It's it's like I say, it's almost a knee jerk. It's like, this is what everyone's using. So we're going to use it and we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, so, so true. Um, also, we talk about in the book, online learning or e-learning. 
Oh, um, yes. I have some hard thoughts on that one. I, I know mm-hmm. you quite well. I have a, mm-hmm. a good friend of mine in Nova Scotia that teaches workplace education courses that have gone online because of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And then I have a number of friends of mine who are educators who teach ye- youth online. Mm-hmm. And, I, and my personal opinion is it's really hard to teach kids at an elementary school level, no matter how much we want to protect their health online. They I think the online learning uh, <clears throat> curriculums are suited better for people that are are more mature learners. Do you have any thoughts on online learning? Um, I, I do. Yes, <laughs> um, I I've taught many years in class, and then with the pandemic, um, we went online, and um, I was very much in favor of this because otherwise the classes would be canceled. Um, I've been now teaching online mostly, but we're starting to get back into class teaching here in Germany, um, for the last uh, two and a half years. And, um, it's, it is two different types of teaching. Um, the online is, you know, you require from the teachers a much higher level of preparation, of, in a different format of, um, of learning and material. Um, you're also, if not physically, in a way you feel that you're in a much smaller space. Um, and anyone who's taught um, in class, you, um, you, uh, you, you unfold in a physical environment. You stand up, you move about, you point, you run over. It's like, you know, I'm Phil Donahue in a classroom. Mm. Um, I have a whiteboard. We have flip charts. You know, there's a beamer. You can go to a student and help them physically on a keyboard discover that key. And it's done instantaneously. Um, A lot of the, or a a great deal of the in-class learning um, is um, it's ad hoc. You know, you have your, your, um, uh, your program and um, then you start to develop um, this on the whiteboard and, and, and the students are involved, you know, putting together posters. There's, there's a really um, a big social element and a creative element to the offline normal schoolroom. Online, you are limited to, um, you know, there we have like online whiteboards. This is fine. Um, if you have the ability or you have the resource of an office that you can, you know, you have a whiteboard and you can move about in. But many of us don't, you know, we're having to teach a classroom of 20, 30 students and we're in our small kitchen office, perhaps. Um, and you're sitting for a long period of time, as are the students. Um, so there are so many difficulties that I find in e-learning, um, uh, in, in comparison to the, uh, to the in-class, um, definite benefits. I mean, I can teach students anywhere in the world and students who are immobile or, or, or sick can still participate, which is, which is amazing. Um, and, um, I find with the different age groups and the different needs, it, it really is very need oriented. Um, seniors I teach, we, we cannot do this online. We've tried. It does not work. Um, children I've taught, this is really difficult because children have a very short attention span. Um, where it seems to work okay is somewhere in the middle, uh, vocational students um, or people who, um, who are doing um, uh, continued education. So people who are used to being online for extended periods of time, it seems to work. Um, the, the last thing that, uh, that is very interesting and frustrating with e-learning is because of the pandemic, we have assumed, well, not all of us, but some people have assumed that an online classroom is the same um, as an offline when it comes to um, periods of time. E-learning was never meant to be signed on at 8.30 in the morning and you leave the classroom at 3.30 in the afternoon. 
that's that's a physical school. That's a physical setting where people can get up and move around and go from room to room. But doing this online, which a lot of um, schools do, um, is extremely detrimental to the learning process. Um, that's my rant <laughs> for the moment. And then, and then the and then the other thing we've got to consider is not everybody's internet connections is equal, and they go down. Like I was sharing this story with you mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. we went to record how I was doing a talk last Friday, and my internet connection decided to go down in the middle of it all. This this is this is a good this is really important. I mean. I, I think, you know, we should spend a lot less time worrying about our online privacy, mm-hmm. which is a, um, which is a privilege. I don't, I do not believe it's a right. Um, and we should then perhaps spend more time thinking about the requirements of our society going forward. If they are going to be more and more online then who are we marginalizing? Because not every child has a device at home. Um, Not every home has wireless or the capacity for more than one or two people to be online at the same time. Right now in, in, in our home, three different people are online doing different things. Now, not every home can do that. So if you don't have the resources, if you don't have the, the access to, to this, then you cannot participate. And access usually means, um, very honestly, money. Mm-hmm. In the same way that if you want to help the environment and drive an electric car, you're going to need more than the price of the car. You need a place to plug your car in. And not everyone has that. Not everyone owns a home. And not anyone, not everyone lives in a building where that is available. Maybe there's two plugs, but there's no more. And there's 12 people living in the building. So access, and you know, this is access is a privilege, and it needs to be turned over to um, a responsibility. Um, mm-hmm. And we could talk about that for a long time. I mean, this is uh, this is a very frustrating things, I think. And um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I agree with that. I'm I'm actually of the belief, you know, without spending a lot of time on it, internet should be treated like electricity and water. We've gotten to that point as a utility. And yes. we know back many, many years ago, governments forced w- running water and electricity into rural neighborhoods, and they subsidized that. Yes. And I, I truly believe the internet should be done, handled the same way. And as we go to this more online-centric world, mm. we're actually um, discriminating against people who don't live in major metropolitan cities, and that's a problem. It really yes. is. We've the the um the the plate has turned um you know when i first was online there was aol okay oh, yeah. um and um uh because of the um of the phone prices you wrote your emails in word or whatever we were using then you logged in you copied the material from Word, you put it in the email, you sent the email, and when it went through, you logged off. Yep. Because online time was then a privilege. And, and it expensive. Cost money and expensive. Yep. Um, now, at that same time, because we're talking pre-2000, at the same time, most of the reservoirs of of um, potable water, so water that we can use and live on in the United States, we're at very acceptable levels. 20 years later, these same reservoirs are sitting at, um, you know, 40% capacity. At the same time, we are sending gigabytes of data 24-7 24-7 across the internet, and we're not thinking about the price. So I find it really interesting that we have two different worlds, you know, where we started that we had perhaps, for example, lots of drinkable water, 
but we had to pay to be online. And now we're in a very different world where drinking water is starting to be possibly a problem. And, um, but no one thinks uh, at all about the price of what we're doing online. Yeah, and I think our cost is a little cheaper. I mean, I've been doing this long enough that I remember the days of doing stuff with the 300 baud modem mm-hmm. where I wrote my email offline and I uploaded it using a mail program just to yep. upload it. Yep. Um, I've been through the CompuServes and the Genies of the world. Yep. So, we, you know, for people who are under 30, they're not going to remember those. Nope. Um, <laughs> I, I've been through what I consider the first social network, and that was IRC, Internet Relay Chat. Mm-hmm. We've all, a lot of us old timers have been there. Yeah. And we've kind of watched the cycles. And people say, oh, Internet's expensive. And I say, I don't know about that because no. I know in the days when we – um, had dial in services. I was paying mm-hmm. for a second phone line, which was yep. 40 or 50 bucks a month at that time. Mm-hmm. So I don't think they're proportionally more expensive. I think it's just the case of getting the technology there. Mm. I know when we were in Canada a couple of years ago, um, you know, we had living, we'd been living in Germany for 30 years, and I did a one year sabbatical in, mm-hmm. um, in Ontario. And um, we were very naive because, you know, any infrastructure prices in Germany are very, very cheap. They're not um, cheap. No. And then, <laughs> you know, we went to Rogers to get our packet, you know, which included our phone, our cable, the whole thing. What we were paying a month in Ontario, we were not paying that for an entire year of the yeah. same services in Germany, we were speechless. I mean, we were, it, we were numb. It was so shocking. Um, and we were very happy when that year was over. I'm uh, sure. <laughs> it's one of the biggest problems in Canada is it doesn't matter who you go with, the, the pricing yeah. is worse than Obscene most places. prices. Yeah. But it doesn't seem to bother people. Um Though at the same time, I think even in water shortages, people will sneak out at midnight and water their lawns. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it doesn't bother people. I just think it's well, a case of it's not been handled. We'll leave it it's, Yeah, I, I think that. I mean, uh, you know, there's we do our things, we pay our taxes, and at the same time we have to worry about these things and then wonder, well, wait a second, the people who are in charge, aren't they paid to do that? I mean, how much do we have to worry about? Mm-hmm. Um, I think we have enough to worry about. So, yes, I, 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 I agree with your point there. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's funny because – we're going back to this topic of education. There's so many ways you can buy mm. courses online. You can jump yep. on YouTube and watch a video. I mean, I like to share the story of my son who's now 30 when he was uh, 17, learned out how to string his first lacrosse stick by watching a YouTube video. And then he just nice. did what they showed him how to do. You can find help with a million and one software packages on YouTube, all free for the taking. I mean, um, it's all there. It, it, it really is. is. Yeah. Google offers so many courses um, uh, for free. Um, you know, there's $12 courses on Udemy for WordPress. Um, I've actually signed up um, uh, for one of Google's new courses. They have a certificate program um, yeah. for digital marketing and e-commerce that they run through Coursera, um, and it's $25 a month, which is quite cheap if you, you know, if you think back how much you spent for your university um, degree. <laughs> or some private courses I've taken. Or some yeah. courses, exactly. <laughs> no, that's, that's yeah. great. Um, I think for education, it's really important because if, you know, if, if, we can we never stop learning and and for anyone for any reason wherever they are if they can access the internet um it's just it's incredible when one considers that when we were in school you had to rush down to the library and hope that the volume of encyclopedia britannica was still there and some other kid hadn't borrowed it 
Mm-hmm. Now we have access to anything that we ever hoped or dreamed to learn. It's it's right there, and it's mostly free. It's, yep. it's incredible. <laughs> It's funny, I still have an old encyclopedia site, but you mentioned it's free, but the one thing you got to watch for is misinformation as well. Yes, um, we've always had to watch for that, I think. Um, I think we're dodging our responsibilities there. That's something that's part of our, you know, the part of one of my courses. Um, uh, You know, we used to be, We used to be smart enough um, to know the difference between, you know, what we're being told and what it really meant. Um, You know, fake news used to be called propaganda, and we understood the reason that someone was saying something. Um, And I think we're shirking our responsibility on that because, you know, this misinformation and fake news and things, um, everyone has an opinion. Everyone has a need to say something to get what they want. And um, I don't know. I, I, I feel that a lot of the talk about fake news is a bit of, um, a bit of um, trying to distance ourselves from our responsibility to listen and to make judgments based on our knowledge. And perhaps it comes down because we just don't have enough knowledge or we're not willing to make a stand. Um, I don't know. Um, we're also perhaps lazy. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of people will look at something and take it for what it is without checking sources, without checking a day, without thinking, why is this information there? What's the point of this information? And should I take it with a grain of salt or not? Um, mm-hmm. We could talk about that for a long time as well. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I've, yeah. I don't know. Yellow journalism, we used to call it. We used to understand why something was being written because everyone and everything has an agenda, whether it be a store, a government, a media channel, our wife, our husband, everyone has an agenda. And based on the agenda, we will say and do things. And it's up to us to understand what that agenda is and if we should listen and how hard we should listen. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's a conversation that we could we, go on and on we with, to be could. honest. With we should have a week <laughs> episode. We're here on Tuesday afternoon, folks. <laughs> yeah, and, and we're still here the following and Tuesday. Still here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Warren, thanks for joining me and talking a little bit about the book. If somebody wants to buy the book, get a hold of you, reach out to you, how's the best way? Um, well, I'm the only Warren Lane Nida in the, in the whole world. So I'm really easy to find on Google. I'm usually on Twitter all over the place. Um, I have a deal, um, on the book for listeners of your show. Um, if they go to my website, um, they can get the digital thinking book and I will have it sent to them, uh, for half price. There's a button there, um, buy now on sale. And um, it is half price, and I will send it directly to your door. Yeah. That's an amazing deal. And the book is well worth the read. I suggest you get it sooner than later because um, you'll Version learn. Three will come out. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Warren. Have a great day. Thank you, Rob. You too. Thanks for having me. Bye bye. This episode of the STM show is sponsored by Stunning Digital Marketing the agency to handle all your WordPress website security needs. Go on over to stunningdigitalmarketing.com and find out how we can help you secure your website so you no longer have an issue with backups, being hacked, or your website being compromised. That's stunningdigitalmarketing.com. Thank you for listening to this edition of the SDM Show. The STM Show is brought to you by Rob Cairns and Stunning Digital Marketing. For more information about Rob Cairns and Stunning Digital Marketing, go to stunningdigitalmarketing.info. From here, you can connect to us on social media, go to our website, and even go to the podcast to subscribe. This podcast is dedicated to my late father, Bruce Cairns. Dad, I miss you very much. Keep your feet on the ground. Keep reaching for the stars. Make your business succeed. A very special thank you to my friend, Warren Lane Nada, for joining me, talking about his book, Digital Thinking Version 2.0. 
jump on Amazon and get yourself a copy. It's a really great read.